In this episode, I will tell you a story that might never have reached the public if it had been up to the witness whether or not to release a statement. But fortunately for us, you might say, it turned out quite the opposite. Contrary to what the witness had initially wanted, the story was made public. And thanks to that, we can hear it. But we must remember, the involuntary release of the story to an ever-curious public would have a major impact on the witness's life. So let's move back in time. It is a late summer evening in southern Denmark on August 13, 1970. Police officer Ewald Hansen Marup is on his way home from work. He is driving on a minor road about to exit onto a major one when something happens. When asked about the curious incident, Officer Hansen retells the events like this. I am driving alone in my patrol car on a Thursday night at around 10.50 p.m. Suddenly, a bright blue-white light surrounds the car and the engine stops. The car's lights go out and I realize that all the electronics in the car are shutting down. The bright neon-like light blinds me so that I can't see anything, even though I shade my face with one hand in front of my eyes. I reach for the radio, but it turns out to be as dead as everything else electrical in the car. I feel the temperature in the car rise to a pleasant warmth, much like the sun on the windshield on a hot summer day. I lean forward and see that a cone of light surrounds the car. The bottom of the cone is probably four to five meters in diameter. I look up through the windshield and see that the light beam ends at the bottom of a large grayish object. If I have to describe the craft, I can only say that it was round and about 10 meters in diameter. It had a hole in the bottom from which the light beam came out. The object had two elevations or domes on the underside. These were about two meters in diameter. At the same time, I note that it is completely silent. Shortly thereafter, the light is pulled up into the grayish object. It is difficult to explain. The light did not go out, but the light moves upwards and disappears, and the object rapidly accelerates vertically and disappears without a sound. The radio crackles, and I understand that the electricity is back. I turn the ignition, and the car starts as usual. I pick up the two-way radio and call the police station. I tell them what I have just experienced. My police colleague at the station asks me if they are going to pick me up with a red admission slip, which is a document with a decision on compulsory admission to a mental hospital. I quickly end the conversation with my colleague and get out of the car. When I put my hand on the front window, I feel that it is still warm. A little while later, an oncoming car drives by, but I don't think to stop it because there is nothing else to see. Despondent about his chances of ever being believed, at first it did not dawn on Officer Hansen that there actually could be a way to prove his claims. As it were, Hansen's patrol car was a brand new Ford Zodiac equipped with a fixed camera facing the road, and he notices that he has taken three pictures during the observation. And in order to have something to compare with, he takes three more pictures from the same spot now that the object has disappeared. On the left side, you can see the pictures taken during the observation, and on the right, the three pictures he took afterwards. After taking the photos, he went home and told his wife, who thought he looked pale, about what had happened. The next day, the media contacted him to hear his story. This was because the police officer, who had asked whether or not they should commit him to a mental hospital, had told a journalist about Hansen's experience. Now the newspapers wanted to hear him tell his story again and again. Hansen later said that if this leak had not taken place, the story would never have come to the attention of the public. He also handed over the film with the photos he had taken to the Air Force for analysis, something that he says was natural for him to do because it was an unidentified aircraft. The Air Force also began mapping radar activity over southern Denmark at the time of the incident. On August 16th, an Air Force officer stated in an evening newspaper that it was the landing lights of a T-33 trainer that Hansen had seen. Hansen himself said that he had seen an airplane 10 minutes after the strange sighting and that the two sightings were not comparable. The light from the strange sighting was much brighter, and the next day, the Air Force press secretary went to the media and denied what the other officer had said on the 16th. 
The press secretary now said that the Air Force could not explain what Hansen had seen, and that it was not one of their aircrafts. The press officer emphasized that they had no reason to doubt that he had seen something strange and was credible. The Air Force also confirmed that Hansen had seen one of their training planes about 10 minutes after the incident, as it matched the place and time. Newspapers began to fill with stories from people who had also seen a light phenomenon on the same night as Hansen. On August 21st, the Air Force issued a final statement saying that many people had seen a shooting star or meteorite that produced a much brighter light than usual, and the media began to lose interest in the matter. When the Air Force had examined the six photos, they could find no explanation for the three taken while the light had enveloped the car. But they also added that the spot of light was not consistent with Hansen's account of a cone of light over the car. The Air Force went to great lengths to explain the incident with a series of strange coincidences. From Hansen seeing the landing lights of a T-33, to a shooting star, to a loose pin causing the car's electronics to temporarily malfunction. While these explanations may have been intended to reassure the public, they had the opposite effect as it appeared in the eyes of the public that the Air Force was trying to hide something. At a seminar on UFOs in Aarhus, a month after Hansen's sighting, a woman stood up and said that the reason she had come to the seminar was because her husband had been serving in the Air Force that night. Her husband had told her that they had followed the UFO on the radar screen all evening. In a letter to a Danish UFO organization two years after the sighting, Hansen wrote, One thing my sighting has taught me is to keep quiet. Under no circumstances do I want to go through the same brainwashing again. I do not know if you can imagine what it is like to have to tell the same story countless times and then have to answer repeated questions from journalists and military personnel who change the story to suit them. Gradually, Hansen accepted his new destiny to tell the story that so many people wanted to hear about. He gave lectures and appeared on radio and television. Der er kørt ned ad bakken. Der går motoren i stå på bilen. Lyset det går ud. Og så er patruljevognen indhyllet i et meget kraftigt lys, der kommer oppe fra luften. At a lecture in Copenhagen on October 25th, 1975, he was asked if he had experienced anything else strange since the 1970 observation. He was silent for a moment and then answered, yes. After that, he started to talk about an event in 1973 that he had kept secret until then. Tuesday, August 14th, 1973. It was at about 10.50 in the evening. I am driving my patrol car on the A-10 highway in a northerly direction. After six kilometers, I turn east. I drive a few hundred meters and suddenly see a familiar bright light on a field north of me, very close to where I saw it the first time. Again, I see a cone of light shining on some frightened cows and horses in the field. The beam moves quickly towards me and is now directly over the car. I notice that the engine stops and the electronics in the car shut down. I see that the object seems to be leaning 45 degrees to the left as if it is trying to shine light into the car. I quickly take four pictures with the car's camera, and they are very similar to the pictures from the first occasion. As the object tilts, I see the outline and bottom of a large object, about 15 meters in diameter. I see three large hemispheres protruding from its bottom. The object is now moving to the right and tilting 45 degrees in the other direction. I see a dome-shaped superstructure with windows around it. The windows are square with rounded corners, like on a passenger airplane. A kind of daylight shines through the windows. The object is completely steel gray and appears to have a smooth surface. Soon the object pulls up the beam and disappears in an easterly direction with a hiss. I try to collect myself, and at the same time I think about the fact that it has been exactly three years and one day since my first sighting, and that no one will believe me. Ewald Hansen Marup died in 1993 only 62 years old. Many might have thought that everything had been said about his spectacular observations. But 43 years later, in 2013, a new witness chose to come forward. 
It was the engineer and former radar operator Nis Krog, who had joined the Air Force in 1969 and worked at a radar station for six years. He says that on the evening and night of Hansen's first sighting in 1970, his radar station followed an object that was moving in the area where Hansen had been located. The object did not move like an airplane, but was at one moment stationary and then suddenly moved in different directions. He says that it was not unusual for them to see such objects on the radar, but that they were told not to talk about them. So why did it take him so long to comment on Hansen's sighting? Well, in 2009, the Danish Air Force decided to make some archives public, which he took as confirmation that he was now free to talk about what he had seen and allowed himself to be interviewed for National Geographic. So what should we believe about Hansen? What indicates that what he claims to have experienced is true and what indicates otherwise? Well, first of all, there are pictures that no one has been able to explain what they actually show, because even though the pictures themselves only show small points of light, the pictures Hansen took immediately after the light disappeared look like what you would expect to see from a still camera mounted on the front of a car. Second, we have the woman who told people that her husband, who allegedly worked in the Air Force on the same evening and night, had registered and followed an unidentified craft on the radar screen. And of course, we also have Krog's statement that his radar station followed an object that behaved strangely on the radar, also on the same night. However, whether the woman's husband and Krog are the same person has been difficult to establish. They could be one and the same person, or they could be separate witnesses that independently gave witness of the same strange phenomenon. Thirdly, we have Hansen himself, who was a police officer by profession and was considered a calm and level-headed person. Furthermore, we can add the circumstance that it was not him who sought attention and told the press about his experience, but a colleague who leaked the information without permission. So what's against him? Well, the pictures do not show more than a few small points of light, and just as the Air Force stated, these do not match his other descriptions. His second observation may also reduce his credibility in the eyes of many. Considering how incredibly few people get to experience something like this, it seems unlikely that the same person gets to do it twice while driving around the Danish countryside. On the other hand, those of you who follow this channel know that there are several cases where those who have encountered strange objects or creatures claim to have had further contacts, and one could perhaps argue that this is also the intention of the visitors. As usual, it is entirely up to you to decide what you think, although I think most of us agree that Hansen certainly experienced something very strange on that August evening in 1970. Thanks for watching. This week I'd like to say a big thank you to those who bought me a coffee at buymeacoffee.com. Thanks to T, RB, Cormac O'Neill, and Neshoba Sipakni. Your support means a lot to me. If you also want to support the channel with a coffee, see the link in the description. Remember to subscribe if you do not want to miss the next episode.